So how many of you went home last night and went through questions? How many questions did you get through? 100. 40. How much? 50? You guys got a long way to go. So, nice bottle of wine, shoes off, start drinking, <laughs> or whiskey, or rum. Back in my car when you go out the side gate, just open up the back, it's all there. Huh? Drinking while going over this? You know, in A school, when you were in A school, you were drinking. Oh, I gotta change this. I got you. I got you, Eric. Thank you. Okay, so yesterday we talked about symmetric before we left. So we talked about the fact that you are going to use the same key to encrypt your information and the same key to decrypt your information. So the problem with that was that we have to get you the key. So there's all these different ways that we can go about getting you the key from one side of the country to the other. I can pick up my phone and call you because that's so secure. Nope, we wouldn't do it that way. Um, let's see. I could fax it to you because that's, nope, that wouldn't be scary either. How about uh, email? Nope, that wouldn't be good either. So one of the best ways to be able to get someone the key, if you remember the movie National Treasure, on the back of the document, they had a bunch of numbers. What were those numbers pointing to? A bunch of letters that were written by Ben Franklin. So it said, go to the third letter, go to the fourth paragraph, go to the third word in the second letter, and that's how you built your key. So this would be one of the ways we could get the key to you for asymmetric algorithm. I could simply say, hey, remember the book we used in class? Go to the fourth page, go to the third paragraph, go to the um, second word and the third letter. And that would be what we would start using for building our key. So symmetric is one of the ways that we can encrypt our messages. The other way is asymmetric. And with asymmetric, what we're using is two keys. So we think about PKI, which is public key infrastructure. So the two keys that we have are the public key and the private key. Both of these keys are related mathematically. We keep our private key private, we share our public key. If I gave you my public key from my public key, could you figure out what my private key is? No. Even if you had the algorithm, you could not figure it out because it's just way too difficult to do that. So these are the two keys that we have and there's a couple ways that we look at this. So again, we have the CIA triangle. So we want to make sure that we take a look at all three of these, confidentiality, integrity, and the authentication. So when we take a look at the public and private key pairs, everybody's been given their pair of keys, okay? So I have my set, you have your set. So I want to send, so the way that we use these is I will use one to encrypt and the second to decrypt. So I'm going to send you my public key. You're going to send me your public key. So I can take my information. I can encrypt it with, the, with your public key, send it to you. What are you going to do? Decrypt it with your private key. So we could now use that information we've sent back and forth as a shared secret, and we can encrypt our data going back and forth with a symmetric key. Because remember, symmetric is a whole lot faster than asymmetric keys. So we want to take a look at the CIA triangle. So we talked a little bit about integrity. So with integrity, what we're going to do is we're going to take the data. We're going to run that through a hashing algorithm. And what comes out of this is the hash. So we'll take the data plus the hash, and this is what we would want to send you. Okay? So we want to take a look at the CIA triangle. Now, if 
I were to encrypt something with my private key, what would you use to decrypt it? My public key. If you do that, it tells you that that message came from me. So we can use the public and private key pair to do two of these things up here. If you send me your public key, I encrypt the data with your public key, send it back to you, you decrypt it with your private key, that takes care of confidentiality. If I were to take the data, encrypt it with my private key, send it to you, you decrypt it with my public key, that gives you authentication that says that came from me. So if we want to cover, if we want to use PKI or public key infrastructure to cover all three aspects of the CIA triangle, the very first thing I'm going to do is take the data that we have. To that, I'm going to add the hash. And now I want to go ahead and encrypt this so that you're the only person who can read this. So how do I encrypt it so you can be the only person to read this? I will encrypt with your public key. What's the only thing that can decrypt this? Your private key. So now I want to go ahead and take care of the authentication side. So now I will encrypt with my private key. I will then send this off to you. So once you receive it, now we start on the outside. I've encrypted the outside of this with my private key. The only thing that will decrypt this would be my public key. So we will now decrypt with my public key. So that takes care of this one. We had, for this middle one, encrypted this with your public key. The only way that we can decrypt that would be to decrypt with your private key. And now we're left with the data plus a hash. So we're now going to take the data that we have, run it through the hashing algorithm, and get the hash out of it. We compare these two hashes. If they match, we're good to go. It means that the message has not been altered from the time I sent it to the time you received it. So this takes care of the integrity side of this. Because you decrypt this with your private key, that takes care of the confidentiality. And since you decrypted this with my public key, you know it came from me, that takes care of the authentication side. So which tool is better? Do you want to use asymmetric, or do you want to use symmetric with the public and private key pairs? Question becomes, what do you want to do? So when we start thinking about what we want to do, we want to combine the two of them. So I take a large file that I have. I take a file that is one gig in size. If I were to use the asymmetric, it's going to take a thousand times longer to send you the data. So I'm going to go ahead and take a symmetric algorithm. DES, TRIP DES, AES is probably what I would use because AES is the most efficient. So I'll take AES and I will encrypt the data with AES. But the thing is, I've got a key that comes into it. Let's say the key is Cisco123. I've sent you the data, you now receive the data. You know that I used AES for this, and now you go, I need the key. What's the easiest way to get you the key? You're going to send me your public key. I take the Cisco 123, which is my key that I use to encrypt the data. I encrypt this now with your public key. Send it back to you, you decrypt it with your private key. 
Now you have Cisco 123. Now you go ahead and decrypt the one gig file I just sent you. And now we both have Cisco 123 on both sides. We can now use this all day long to encrypt and decrypt our data going back and forth. Tomorrow, it's your turn to come up with a new key. So tomorrow, you come up with Cisco 321. Now you have to get that to me. How do you get it to me? What do I need to send you? My public key. You'll take Cisco 123 and my public key, encrypt it, send it to me. I'll decrypt it with my private key. We now have Cisco 321. We use that all day long to encrypt the data going back and forth. Why would we want to do this? Why do we want to change the key every day? What's that? So it doesn't get compromised. Or if it does get compromised, it's only good for the one day. You don't get to keep it all day long or all week long or all year long to be able to send the traffic back and forth. So Matt up here was talking to me about uh, the museum that's over here. There's a cryptographic museum here on base. And they have this thing called an Enigma machine in there. What was the Enigma we used for? What's that? To do what? Mm -hmm. The Enigma machine has three wheels on it. So at midnight every day, they would change the order of what they had. They had a little booklet, and they would use that. To, to, so the Germans were smart. They changed their key every day. And you could capture their message, say, well, gee, I broke the key three weeks ago. So the same key. No, they changed it every day. So anybody see the movie Imitation Game? What a great movie. Not too many people knew that Alan Turing was one of the smartest people in the world. How did he finally figure out how to break the key? And this is the solution right here. What is this? You think it's coffee, don't you? It's actually dark rum. No, I'm just kidding. I wish it was. It is coffee. Every morning, Alan Turing went out to get coffee. He ran across the same lady every morning. And what would she say? Good morning, Alan. What he realized was that every morning the same greeting goes on, which meant that at the end of every message from the Germans, they had the same sign-off, which was Heil Hitler. When he realized that, all of a sudden this thing went off in his head where he went, you know what, if we know that, we can use that to figure out what the key is. So it had been taking him... 23 and a half hours to figure out what the key was. So now for the last 30 minutes, they could break the German codes going back and forth. After they realized that every message ends in Heil Hitler, after capturing a couple messages, they could then figure out the rest of the code and what those three wheels were set for. They then figured it out within 30 minutes, which means that now for 23 and a half hours, for every message coming through, they could now read the German messages. So one of the things you're always taking a look at is if I'm going to be using a key and a code to encrypt my messages going back and forth, it's best to only use that for one day. If you think about the, we talked yesterday about the wireless WEP. WEP used an initialization vector of 24 bits. What they realized was that it's very easy to break that. So they increased the number of bits to 48 bits. But they also did the temporal key exchange which says that after sending 10,000 packets back and forth, let's change the key on both sides. And they do this internally, which means that even if you capture the key, you're only going to get a portion of the conversation. So the keys become real important. The longer the key, the more times you change this, the more important it becomes for us. So let's take a look now at the, let's see here, lectern. Hey, I did it right this time. I remembered something from yesterday. should have this all down by Friday. Maybe. So in this chapter, we're taking a look at cryptographic principles. We're going to talk about the symmetric and asymmetric, which we've already seen up on the whiteboard. We're going to talk about some cryptographic <laughs> caching. So when we take a look at encryption, you again have your message. You're going to encrypt it with a key. This is your ciphertext that we're sending across the wire. You have the same key that we have to get to the other side. They'll decrypt the message, and now they can see what's there. 
we always have to think about how strong is the algorithm, how strong is the key that we have. And what is one of the things that we think about is the work factor. How long is it going to take for someone to break the key? And that's always the big part of this is do we make the key extremely difficult? It's kind of like your password. Do we make the password so long and so crazy that it's going to take forever for someone to break this? Of course, it's going to take you forever to remember this. Are you going to write this down? This is always the tough part of any sort of key that you have is how do you get the key to the other side and how do you make sure that they are getting it correctly? So when we look at the symmetric side, the symmetric side's good for sending bulk data from one side to the other. So we've talked about the substitution ciphers. We talked about the transposition ciphers. Uh, we've also talked about steganography, hiding information, hiding a secret message inside of something else. So with steganography, you can be hiding messages inside of photographs. You can hide messages inside of video, inside of audio. There's all these different tools out there. Some of the steganographic tools actually allow you to take the data that you want to bury inside of a picture and encrypt that data. So it requires a password and an encryption key that it automatically does and puts it inside of a picture. And then as long as you've got the right tool on the other end, you can then decrypt that message. And that's always the tough part because there's 30,000 steganographic tools out there. Which one do I use? When we think about digital encryption, <clears throat> We think about sending our message across the wire. You don't want to send any message across the wire in clear text because somebody can capture that and they can come back and go, hey, I got your message. Oh, look, you're going to the bank. Let's alter this. Or better yet, I'll capture this and I'll just go and borrow some money from you as well. So we want to make sure that the data going across the wire is encrypted. So anything that's being transported across the wire, we want to make sure it gets encrypted. We also think about things that we store on our laptop. We want to make sure that that is encrypted as well. So anything that's in memory. Uh, cryptographic obfuscation. We want to use cryptography to hide the meaning of the message so somebody can't just look at it and read the message. So we've got the symmetric algorithms, the asymmetric algorithms, and something called cryptographic hashing. So what is hashing? Let's take a quick look at hashing. So one of the things I put on my laptop here, oh, I'm going to have to go back and tell it what we want. This drives me crazy. I always save this, but it keeps telling me to extend the displays. So one of the tools that I use in my Cisco classes is something called Cisco's Packet Tracer, and this is Packet Tracer. So let me go ahead and bring a router up here. First thing I want to do is go my options, preferences, and I'm going to make my font a little bit bigger. This is not for you. This is for me because my eyes are not that good. You guys have a lot to look forward to as you get older. Things don't always work. <laughs> You're looking at me like, what the heck is, are you talking about? That was good, Sarah. Okay. So that's big enough. Hopefully you can see that. So in looking at my configuration, my password would be sitting right between my host name and where it says IPSAF at the bottom of the page. So there are a couple things on here that are always a little disconcerting to me. The first one is no service timestamps for logging and debugging. You always want to turn on your timestamps because you want the local time to be put on your logs as they're being sent out to your syslog server. The other one says no service password encryption. So let me show you why this is also of concern to me. So let me just jump in here real quick and type in um, enable password. Cisco. So now you see the enable password of Cisco, and you see Cisco in clear text right here. Would you ever want to share this configuration file with anyone? 
No, they're going to be able to see your password just that easy. So what I can do with this is I can go ahead and do uh, service password encryption. And now I do a do show run. So now you look at this and you go, oh, my enable password is a type 7 password. And it's got this whole bunch of numbers at the end of this and some letters. This is converting that password over to hexadecimal. Does that mean I could simply break this if I went online? Yeah, there's a place you could go called firewall.cx. I could put in that type 7 password, and I can break the password just that quick. Just boom, it's done. So instead of doing a enable password, what we should have said was enable secret Cisco. Tells me I shouldn't have the same password in two places. But now when I take a look at the enable secret, I see this large set of characters right here. What is that? Well, the number to the left of that blue thing is the number five. What that is is MD5 hashing algorithm. The blue portion is the hash. Could I take the hash and go into Kane enable, put the hash in there and tell it to break the password? Yes, with brute force, it's going to try every combination of characters, boom, 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 boom. Because it's five characters, it's going to take a few minutes to do this, and it'll pop up and go, hey, your password's Cisco. So it'll actually break this in about, since I'm just looking at lowercase letters, it'll do it within 55 minutes. So Cisco's in the middle of the alphabet, so the last letter O is what they start looking at. So that's going to take probably about 30 minutes to break. So it is possible to break this. If I made the password longer, if I said Cisco123, 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 and made it, what is that, a 24 characters long, that would take 20 million years to break. So the longer you make the hash, or I should say the longer you make the password, the, the better it's going to be, the stronger it's going to be, the longer it's going to take someone to break this. The hash is always 128 characters long because it's MD5. So again, we make the hashes longer to make it more secure. So that's a hashing algorithm that we have. So you have tools like this that will automatically do the hashing for us. So when we take a look at the cryptographic hash, that's what's happening with this, is that it's automatically going in, taking a look at that hash that we have. So when we take a look at that, Cryptographic hash, that would be what we're looking at. Confusion, diffusion, that's what we looked at yesterday. When you take a look at the um, transposition and substitution ciphers that we did, those are confusion and diffusion. So when I was in uh, ninth grade, I took Mr. Poole's mathematics class. I remember him sitting there saying, you're going to learn the new math. So one of the things that they taught us was the different forms of mathematics. When you take a look at something like octal, hexadecimal. And then they said, of course, the new math is binary. How many of you played around in binary? Bunch of ones and zeros. Those are the only two choices, one or zero. So when you think about binary and the fact that we're representing our, our information with a one or a zero, uh, part of what came out of what they called the new math were was something called Boolean algebra. What is Boolean algebra? being able to manipulate the ones and zeros in several different ways. Um, how does information make its way across the internet? PFM, pure fun magic, yes. <laughs> when we take a look at any workstation, it's got two addresses that we are concerned with. One is the IP address of where you're going, and the second is the subnet mask. So one of the mathematical functions that we use in Boolean algebra is something called logical AND. 
So what we're doing with logical AND is we're going to take your IP address, we're going to take your subnet mask, we're going to do a logical AND between them. It's going to tell me the network address that you live on. So it's basically going to say, hey, here's the beginning street, the beginning address of your street. We want to just send you here. Boom. So when I come into a router, the router's going to take my destination address and its IP address, do a logical AND and go, oh, that's out of port serial zero zero and your gateway is going to be the 20 20 20 20 address and it's going to go ahead and send that traffic off to that location when it gets to the next router it does the exact same thing and it does that through the routers until it makes its way to its location so that would be one of the boolean algebra mechanisms that we can use another way we can encrypt our data is something you call the exclusive or when we take a look at the exclusive or you have to do this in binary so when we take a look at using exclusive or we're going to be doing this with a binary stream, and our key will also be in a binary stream. And if there's two digits that are identical, two ones or two zeros, the result will be a zero. If there's one one in there, that means that the answer will be a, a single one. The thing about this is I can do an exclusive OR between the message, the key, and then I get the encrypted data. I take the encrypted data exclusively OR it with a key, I get back to the message. So this is one of the easiest ways to do a stream cipher, which means I'm sending things out in binary. But we normally don't do that. We send out things in blocks, blocks of 64 bits, because when you think about the alphabet that we use, we're using blocks of text to do this. We have to use a block of bits to start recognizing different letters that we have out there. So this is why we use the exclusive or and or the logical AND is our functions to be able to send traffic across the wire. The best part of that is you don't even have to know how it works. Why? Because internally it all, does it all for us. The routers do this. The switches do this. We don't even have to think about it. So when you start looking at that, you're just going, hey, wow, this works really well. And I don't even have to think about how it works. I just know that it does work. It gets me there. It gets my answers back to me. And... There we go, pure fun magic right across that wire. Don't even have to think about it. So when we take a look at the key strength again, the key strength comes down to how many characters do I have in my key. Again, yesterday I talked about the fact if I'm only using three characters and I'm only using lowercase, it's just going to be 26 times 26 times 26. But if I use the full set of characters of 77, it's now going to be for three characters, 77 times 77 times 77. The larger the number of characters possible, the bigger the key, the harder it's going to be for someone to break this. The more characters I put in there, the better it's going to be. So we always look at the key length versus the effective strength. Oh, we have some computers out there that are pretty amazing nowadays. Anybody ever see or read either the movies by Dan Brown or the books by Dan Brown? What'd you read? What's that? Da Vinci Code? What else? Angels and Demons. Did you read uh, Digital Fortress? You did. Do you, do you remember the premise that involved the NSA? Oh, can I say that here on base or am I going to get in trouble? I'm going to say it anyway. It's just a fiction book, right? It was funny because uh, I was doing a class and I was asking one of my students, where do you get your lines for your access list? And he's going, I just make them up as I go. Shouldn't all that information be in your security policy? He says, but we don't have a security policy. So I just make it up as I go. I said, you know, the last person I saw that went like this to tell me where they get their ideas was Michael Crichton when he was telling me about how he came up with the book Terminal Man. I'm like, you just made this up? And he goes, well, yeah, we were a little drunk at the time. So his brother, Doug, writes for the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. So these guys were so funny when they got drunk. It's just like, oh, yeah, we bounce ideas off each other. and We just make things up. So when you start thinking about the way that we make passwords, we can just simply go and grab what we need. So when you think about any fiction book, that's what they're doing is making stuff up. So Dan Brown's <clears throat> book, Digital Fortress, is great because he talks about the fact that the NSA has in their basement a computer system 
that can break any encryption algorithm in five minutes or less. Could be, we never know. So right after I read the book, I'm doing a class up in Baltimore at the New Horizons for the NSA. I have 24 students in class. <clears throat> and I went, this is really funny, you guys work at the NSA because I just finished this book that talks about the NSA. And I said, this is <clears throat> a book by Dan Brown. I got a guy that's sitting on the left side of the room and <clears throat> he looks up and he goes, no, 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 Dan Brown does not know what he's talking about. And he jumps up for the next five minutes. He goes off about why this could never happen. What does that tell you? They probably have it in the basement. Did you hear me say that? <laughs> so you start thinking about things like this. If you think about the advanced computing power that we have, there's something called Moore's Law. Who was Mr. Moore? CEO of Intel. What does Intel do? They make our chips for our computers. What was Moore's Law? We will double computing power every 18 months. Have they been doing that for the last 30 years? Pretty much they have. They dropped off a little bit there, but they've been able to keep that up pretty steadily. So we always think about the fact that computers are now running faster and faster and faster, better and better, so our ability to break the encryption algorithms becomes much better because we've got faster systems. We've got quantum computers now, and that does help. So the, our ability to break the encryption algorithm varies by the type of encryption. There are also cryptographic vulnerabilities in there. When individuals write the software for the encryption algorithm, many times we're attacking the algorithm, not the data. So we're not trying to break your password, we're trying to break the algorithm. And many times that's what people are able to do. So we have a key. I have a key that I use to encrypt my information. I've sent the key to you. How do we secure the key? Do we write it down and put it on a piece of paper and leave it on the desk? Because we have a clean desk policy. I'm going to put it under my book because nobody's going to look there. So you always have to think about your key and what goes on. When we get into the public key infrastructure, PKI, we talk about the fact that you have a private key that's on your computer system. There have been many instances where upper management teams, talking about the CEO, CIO, CFO, COO, all get together for a little junket down in Martinique. So they all jump on a plane, the plane is on its way down to Martinique, and the plane goes down somewhere between here and there. Everybody on board is killed. Somebody now has to pick up the pieces for the company. They've got to go in and find out what contracts were written, and they've got to find out what communications were made with vendors and customers, do they need the keys to be able to do this? Yeah, if I want to be able to read your emails, I'm going to need your private key. I'm going to need the private keys for all these people. We've got to think about where are the keys stored and how do I keep this secure. Would it be best to go ahead and get a copy of everybody's key and put that in a vault somewhere and give our attorneys access to that should something happen to the upper management team? This is called succession planning. You want to make sure that you think about who's going to take over should something happen to you. So that's one of the things to think about. We'll see that coming up a little bit later on. We always look at security versus performance because we want something that we can encrypt and decrypt rather quickly, but we also want to maintain that level of security. So we're always looking at the fact that there might be some legal restrictions on the type of systems we're using and the type of programs that we use. What's faster, a stream cipher or a block cipher? Well, your stream cipher is actually faster than the block cipher, but everybody uses block ciphers. Why? Because we're using block sizes of 64 bits. So that's going to send four characters through. Okay? So we can actually then start sending this through as four bit or eight bit blocks, and we're going to use eight eight bit blocks as we send our traffic through. So in something like semantic security, we can go ahead and take your plain text and then we can go ahead and use a secure cipher, which is basically going to diffuse the image inside of what we're sending you to where you can't read what's going on. So if I'm using an insecure cipher text, 
you can still read a portion of what's there. If it is a secure cipher, then as we blend this into your picture, there's no way that you can see that message inside of the picture. So, when the NSA and NIST decided they wanted to start using encryption algorithms to encrypt the data that they've got for their uh, unsecured information, they decided to use DES and TripDES. So DES is the digital encryption standard. DES came out in the 70s, was written by IBM, used to be called Lucifer, and DES eventually got broken in 30 minutes. So the NSA could put it on their system in their basement. They could break it in 30 minutes. And they admitted to that one. Yeah, we can break it in 30 minutes. And that was in the 19, early 1990s. So they decided that we're just going to do DES three times, so we're going to call it trip DES. So we're just going to take the output from one, input of the next, the output of the Number two round is going to be the input for number three round. So in doing this, they had to come up with different modes of operation. Anybody here a graduate student? Anybody been a graduate student? So when I was in college, I went back to school for my MBA, and I was writing my thesis, and my advisor came to me and went, hey, we have a project we can put you on, and we can have you out of here in six weeks. Really, you're trying to get rid of me? And I thought about how much co college is costing me, and I thought, this would be good. Let me get out of school as quickly as possible. And graduate students like to stay in school. Why? It's a nice, safe, warm place to be. You end up getting a grant to work on a project, so you know, you're making 20 bucks an hour doing some sort of research project. And you're going, I could do this for the rest of my life. But many professors go, well, we'd like to bring in the next group of people because we're looking for that next genius that's going to come into our department and make us lots of money. So I look at this, these modes of operations as something that came from MIT. So somebody created DES, and then somebody decided there are different ways that we can get our graduate students to write different modes for DES, and eventually we can get these guys out of school. So I'm going to bring in a, a, a way of explaining the electronic code book, the cipher block chaining, the cipher feedback mode, the output feedback mode, and the counter CTR mode by bringing in a different slideshow. Uh, I work for Phoenix TS, and with Phoenix TS, we did our own slideshow for the CISSP class. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth. If you want a copy of this, I'm more than happy to share this with you. So uh, let's come on down. So we took a look at symmetric. I'm using the same key to encrypt and decrypt. And then for the public and private key pair, we're using one key to encrypt and one key to decrypt. So let me come on down here. So that's your asymmetric. Let me get down into, that's your, so that's your exclusive OR that we talked about a moment ago, doing exclusive OR. So what you can do with the exclusive OR, you can take your message, you can exclusively OR it with a key and come up with a ciphertext. Then you can do it backwards. You can take the ciphertext, exclusively OR it with the key and get back your message. So it's an easy way of being able to send your data back and forth. So let me get down to DES. I mentioned in DES, what we're going to do is we're going to be using symmetric block cipher. We're going to be using blocks of 8 bits. So I'm going to have a block actually of 64 bits, and I'm going to split it into 8 groups of 8. Each one of these boxes of 8 bits is going to be called a substitution block. The reason I want to do this is because I also have a key that is 64 bits long, but the effective key is only 56 bits because each one of the blocks of eight has one parity bit in there. What's a parity bit? Let's say that inside of my block of seven, I have four ones. That's an even number. But if I'm using an odd par parity, it means that I've got to have an odd number of ones, I will put a one at the end. If on the other hand, I have three ones in there and it's an even parity, 
I'll put a one at the end to make that an even number of ones. And that's one of the things that we have to be able to do. So what I'm going to do is take the data, split it up into eight groups of eight, and I'm just going to go ahead and start encrypting the information. So the input into the encryption algorithm gives me an output. The output of that becomes the input for the next one. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take those keys that we have. So again, I've got a 64-bit key, and the 64-bit key is split up into subkeys, keys one, key 1 through key 8. So it's going to be 7 bits plus a parity bit. And then at the bottom of this, we have what is known as the key sample schedule. I first want to use key 6, then key 3, key 5, key 8, key 7, key 1, key 2, key 4. So how does this work? When I take my data coming in, the data comes into the DES encryption algorithm. Key 6 comes into it. The output of this becomes the next input. I now put in key 3. The output of this comes in, then key 5. Then the output gets doubled up with key 8, and then key 7, key 1, key 2, key 4. How do I decrypt this? I use the keys in the reverse order. That's all it takes. So we're encrypting it one way, we decrypt it going back the other way. So this would be the things that I need to know to make this work. Okay, so let's, okay, so here's DES. DES has four different operating modes down here at the bottom. The ECB, electronic codebook, cipher block chaining, cipher feedback mode, the output feedback. So let's take a look at each one of these. Yeah, this is not in your book. It, your book actually just gives you a description. This gives you a picture of what it looks like. This is why I like to look at this. So here's your plain text coming in. Your key comes in. This is your DES. And we have the cipher text coming out. So all we're doing is we're taking our data and splitting it out and saying, here's my data. Here it comes in. And if anybody, again, wants a copy of the slideshow, I'm happy to share this with you. So this is coming down into the encryption algorithm box. And then what comes out of this is the ciphertext. So this is what you would be seeing going across the wire. So they said, you know what? We've got some graduate students here at MIT. We need to get rid of some of them. So let's come up with another way of doing this. So they used what is called cipher block chaining. And this is what is used most prevalently by most companies and most encryption algorithms. What I'm going to do is take my plain text. I'm going to exclusively or it with a random number that I'm putting in here. So by putting those two together, that becomes the input to my block cipher along with my key. The output of this is my first section of ciphertext. But the output of this also gets exclusively ORed with the next section of plain text coming into this. So we call it cipher block chaining because I'm chaining this one with the next one, the next one, as we go down across the wire. So this is what is used by even some of the wireless stuff. So uh, WPA2 uses cipher block chaining in its goal to be the strongest of the encryption algorithms. We also have the cipher feedback mode. With the cipher feedback mode, my data is coming in, or I'm sorry, initialization vector is coming in. I'm going to take my data, exclusively or it, with the output here, and that becomes my ciphertext. And I'm also going to take a copy of that becomes the next input over here, the key. Notice where this line is. This is coming after we've exclusively ORed it. The next one's going to have this line coming up right here. So just by making that simple change, they probably got rid of at least another graduate student, maybe two. Because MIT likes to get rid of their graduate students and get the new flock of geniuses in all the time. So here's my cipher. Uh, output feedback mode. So again, you'll notice that line is sitting up above where the plain text comes in and exclusively ORs with that output. So this is just another method that we have of doing this. So when you take a look at some of the ways that we do this, it's just another way of encrypting the information. Do you know when you're using DES which mode they're using? No. Do you care? No. All you care is that your information gets encrypted before sending it out and that the other side can decrypt the information. So we take a look at this one. We have what is known as a nonce or a random number. You'll notice at the end of each one of these, the counter here is 0, counter 1, counter 2. 
So we just keep increasing this by one. So that becomes the input along with my key. I'm gonna exclusively or the output with my plain text and that becomes the cipher text. So these are just some of the different ways that we can en encrypt our data going through. So unfortunately, Our book doesn't do a real good job of showing you the diagrams of how this works, but this other slideshow actually does a pretty good job of showing those. I wouldn't worry about the Galos counter mode. It just happens to be another one that's out there, and I've never seen that used by anybody. When we take a look at the symmetric algorithms, there's quite a few symmetric algorithms out there. Again, DES was one of the first ones. It's obsolete because it was broken very quickly. TripDES is using DES three times. The effect of strength of that is only going to be 80 bit, even though it's three rounds of 56 bits. Our AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, has three different levels in it. It's got the 128, the 192, and the 256. So if you're using AES 256, it's going to take about 200 lifetimes of generations through your family before that encryption algorithm will be broken. So I wouldn't worry about that during your lifetime. If you think about the fact that we are very close to the ocean here, think about fishes. So some of the other symmetric algorithms have names of fishes, blowfish, two fish, cast, serpent, anything doing with the water usually is a symmetric algorithm. RC4, which was the stream cipher that was used or the WEP encryption algorithm for wireless, also a symmetric algorithm that's out there. So these would be some of the choices that we have for symmetric algorithms. So a message can have multiple keys. You can have different keys for the same message coming through. So again, anytime we're sending a message, we wanna make sure that we know what the key are, keys are. We think about the key duration. How long should you keep the key? You think about the digital signature that you've got with your CAC, how long is that good for? Two years? Then you get a new CAC and it's got a new digital signature on it. So yeah, your key that you've got on that is good for two years. So you start thinking about the duration, how long should we keep that key for? So we have different machines that are gonna generate those keys for us. And of course, the biggest problem that we have is I've just received my key. How do I exchange my key with you? So if, if I'm going to be using a symmetric key, I've got to figure out how do I get this to you? Do I send it across the wire that everybody else can read? Or do I call you up and send it to you in a different fashion? So I always have to think about the keys that we have. We have something called perfect forward secrecy. Basically, the longer the key is being used, uh, the more we have to be concerned about it. So we want to be able to alter that ever so slightly the next couple times that we use, use it. So that's one of the things that we can do. So we've talked about the public and private key pairs. Again, with our public and private key pairs, which are still over here on the whiteboard, you use one key to encrypt your information, the other key to decrypt it. So the biggest use that we use this for is to share a symmetric key. So again, remember, symmetric algorithms, DES, TripDES, AES, are much faster than the asymmetric. We use the asymmetric to, sh to basically send your key back and forth. So I come up with a good key, Cisco one, two, three. I need to get it to you. You'll send me your private key, your public key. I'll encrypt it with your public key. I'll send it back to you. You'll decrypt it with your private key. Now we've got Cisco one, two, three that we can use back and forth for the day to encrypt our data. The problem that we have with asymmetric is that it has longer keys and slower performance, which means that if I've got bulk data that I want to send back and forth, it's better to use a symmetric algorithm because it's a thousand times faster in encrypting the data and decrypting it at the other end, which means that if I spent all of my time using asymmetric, it would take a, long, a much longer time to encrypt and decrypt our messages. We have three different or four different types of asymmetric. Uh, do they still have? No, they, yeah, really the, the top four are the ones we look at. RSA, Ravi Shamir and Edelman. Ron Rovest, Adi Shamir, two professors from MIT that share an office. Uh, Leonard Edelman is right next door. 
These guys were mathematicians and still are mathematicians uh, up at MIT. They came up with the RSA encryption algorithm, so it's using the RSA token to encrypt and decrypt our messages going back and forth. NIST came up with a standard of DSA, which is the Digital Signature Algorithm. It's using a one-way problem called the discrete logarithm in a finite field. Uh, on Saturday morning, Matthew Gorham's going to get up and he's going to give us a presentation on discrete logarithms in a finite field at 4.30 in the morning on Saturday. I'm sorry, I won't be here, Matt, for your presentation. Let me know how that one goes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, for those who love calculus and playing with mathematics, that's a great lecture not to go to. I've seen it and I just kind of went, whoa, okay, whatever they're smoking. No, I'm not going not to go there. Every one of you has used ECC this morning if you have a smartphone. ECC is elliptical, crypt elliptical curve cryptography. Uh, high performance, shorter keys than RSA. It's used to encrypt your messages going across with your phone. So it doesn't require a lot of power. So ECC was picked up by the phone companies to actually be used there. Diffie and Hellman. Diffie and Hellman are mathematicians who, when they went to graduate school, were up in the archives looking at some of the old PhD theses that were out there and they found a PhD thesis that was written in the 1920s that talked about doing a public and private key in a key exchange without having any knowledge of the other person. And they looked at this and they went, wow, nowadays we have computers. Maybe we can rewrite this so it can be used on a computer system. The Diffie and Hellman key exchange protocol with one of the graduate students they worked with named Oakley came up with the Diffie Hellman key exchange, which is used in a VPN tunnel. So if you're using IPsec on a VPN tunnel, you are using the Diffie Hellman key exchange just to be able to get your keys back and forth without prior knowledge of the person at the other end. So quantum cryptography is going to be the next move that we make in cryptography, it's using quantum uh, computers to be able to do this. The problem with quantum computers is they're very expensive. They have to be very, very cold, so they have dry ice that's sitting around these things. They've got to be down in the minus 200 degrees Kelvin to be able to actually operate and get these high speeds going on. So the next big move is going to be the quantum cryptography. So that probably won't be fully functional for the next 10 to 20 years. So we took a look at the hash. The hash is a one-way function. As we saw a moment ago with the Cisco router, I took the word Cisco. I put Cisco into the hash, it came out with a hash. I can't take the hash, reverse it, and find the word Cisco. It's impossible to do that. The only thing I can do is take that hash, try every combination of characters out there, doing a brute force attack until I find something that matches that hash. When I match that hash, it's okay, I've broken the hash. I figured out what it was that created the hash. You can put anywhere from, a, from one character to a billion characters into the hashing algorithm, and you always get the same hash coming out when you put the same characters into it. So you're always getting the same output from that. So that's what's nice about the hashing algorithm is it's very consistent in the way it works. So it's providing for us that data integrity, also known as the fingerprint of your data. So if I have a, a file that's sitting here and I've run it through the hashing algorithm, I could use the hash to identify the file that I've created. So that's one of the things that they do in the federal government. So we also, also have to think about the key generation that we've got for our hashes. So we get, end up with a key and then we end up hashing that. So we always have to think, where have I stored this hash? How have I stored it? If you think about my Microsoft system I've got sitting right here, my Microsoft system has hashes on there. So the password to get into our laptops was temp101. So that is stored in a hash inside of my system. If I can get the hash, can I break the password? 
If I get the hash, I can try all these combinations of characters to figure out what the password is. So I can't just look at the hash and reverse that and get the password. It's not what we do. Now, there is an, a way to obfuscate this. It's called salting. We're going to add a few characters into your password. So I have the password of Cisco. Before I type in the password Cisco, they're going to add four characters to the beginning of this. The end, they're going to add six more characters. They've added 10 characters to the word Cisco. When they hash this thing, it's no longer the word Cisco. It's Cisco plus 10 more characters, which means the hash that comes out, if you reverse that, it's not going to give you the word Cisco. If you were able to take that and keep putting the inputs in there until you find something that creates the word Cisco or creates the hash that I have, we don't know about the salted characters. When I sit down on that router that's got the salted password, when I type in the word enable, it pops up and goes, would you please put in the password? It's already put in those four characters that I don't know about. Then I type in the word Cisco. When I'm done, it adds the other six characters, and I hit the enter key. Now it's going to go ahead and hash that for the 15 characters. It's going to match that hash with what's it, what it has in its file. It's going to say the hash matches. We're good to go. Let Eric in so he can do his work. So salting is one of the mechanisms that we use to obfuscate people who have tools like Cain and Abel, John the Ripper, Loftcrack, Offcrack, so they can use that to reverse the hash or at least try the... Um, possibility of trying all the different characters so that we can figure out what your password is going to be. So doing that brute force attack that we have. I like their demonstration over here on the right hand side. They took the number 7254398, they added up all those digits, came up with 38, added 3 plus 8, got 11, added to 1 plus 1, came up with 2 and said that's one of the ways you could figure out what a hash is going to be. So that's not really what they do, but that's just a demonstration of a way of doing a hash. So we have a couple different ways that we can authenticate you. So we can do this just with the hash itself. So we, we've got Alice, we've got Bob, we've got the message. We took that message, ran it through the hashing algorithm. So Alice has sent Bob the message plus the hash. How does Bob authenticate this? He takes that message, runs it through the same hashing algorithm, compares the hash and says, you know what, we are good to go. We have two other ways of doing this. We have the HMAC, which is known as the Hashed Message Authentication Code, and the Digital Signature. So I'm going to take you back over to the other slideshow because Phoenix TS actually did this very nicely. Come on, you. Oh, I got to close out the other one. That's what you're telling me is going on. Okay. That's why it happened. Okay.
Okay, so let's begin by taking a look at creating the hash. This is Bob. Remember, we got Bob and Alice. This is naked Bob. Why is Bob naked? Well, he's at home. He's working from home. Can't you work on your computer naked if you want at home? Is his room warm or is it cold? It's cold because he's blue. So he's got the text. He's going to now run it through the hashing algorithm. He's going to get the message digest, also known as the signature. He's going to take the text. He's going to add that message digest, and then he's going to send the message off to Alice. Alice is also naked at her house, but she's warm. Why? Because she's kind of pinkish. Notice she's got the glow over her head. That's a little, she's got a halo up over her head. So she's now going to take the text and the digest that she's got. She's going to split the two of those apart. She's going to take the text that she received from Bob. She's going to run through the hashing algorithm. She's going to get the message digest. She's then going to compare the two message digests. If they match, it says the information is verified. It has not been altered. So we have a couple other ways of actually doing this. So let's come on down here and take a look at how does Alice know that the message came from Bob? If you remember, we talked about the fact that I can take a shared secret that we can share on both sides. I'll take the, the word or the password, Cisco123, that's our shared secret. You're going to send me what? So that I can encrypt this. Your public key. I'll encrypt Cisco123 with a public key. I will send it to you. You'll decrypt it with your private key. And we now have Cisco123 on both sides. We both have a shared secret. So how do we make sure that this message came from Bob? Alice is going to send Bob a shared secret, maybe Cisco123. So they now both have this on both sides because they've used the public and private key pairs to get this back and forth. So what Bob's going to do is take that data plus the secret key, and he's going to create the what's known as the HMAC out of this. So let's take a look at how he does this. He's now going to take his text. He's going to add that secret key of Cisco123 with this. He's then going to go ahead and run it through the hashing algorithm, and this is known as the message authentication code. So now he's going to go ahead and take the text and the message authentication code and send it off to Alice. What is Alice going to do? Alice is going to take the text. She's going to add that secret key to it. Same thing that Bob did. She's going to now run it through the hashing algorithm, and she's going to get the message authentication code. She's now going to compare her message authentication code with that that Bob sent her. It's going to tell her two things if this validates. What two things does it tell her? What's that? It came from Bob because that's shared secrets on both of them. And the second thing? It's not been altered from the time it was sent to the time it was received. So the HMAC is simply saying, let's add that shared secret that we both know about to be able to make sure that this really came from Bob. Okay? Yes, sir. In most cases, this is done. This is done behind the scenes, and you wouldn't even know it. Right. Just so. It's, I'm just trying to apply it to something that, like, really. Happens. So, you and I decide we want to send a message back and forth. Yeah. So, I say, okay, I, I've got the key of Cisco one two three. You're going to send me your public key. I'm going to get Cisco one two three and send it to you. You'll decrypt it. So we now have this. Our messages, if we set them up ahead of time, will automatically take that shared secret and add that to our data before it runs it through the hashing algorithm. So yeah, you would have to set this all up ahead of time. So you would have to have this program on both sides to be able to make this work. Yes, sir. Thank you for the segue, because the next thing that we're going to take a look at here is the digital signature. So up above, we are using the text plus the secret key to get the MAC or the message authentication code. Now we're going to go ahead and look at this digital signature. So the digital signature is a little bit different on how we do the digital signature. So thank you for the segue on that one. You'll get your $20 from Matt later on.
but you've got to come up with the next four in a row to get that, by the way. Okay, so here's Bob again. Bob has got his text. He's now going to run this through the hashing algorithm, and he's going to get the message digest. So if we think about the public and private key pair, is there something that Bob can use to encrypt the digest that says it came from him? He could encrypt it with his private key. What would decrypt that? His public key. So here's Bob using his private key to encrypt this. Now, I don't know what you call this on the end. I'm calling it gobbledygook because that basically tells you exactly what's over here on the right-hand side. Now I'm going to take the data plus the gobbledygook and send this off Alice. What's Alice going to do with his digital signature when she gets it? Well, Bob has already sent her his public key. So she already has his public key. She's going to take that data. She's going to run through the hashing algorithm as she's done before. She's got the message digest, but she also has the gobbledygook that's underneath Bob's text message. So she separated that out. She's now going to use Bob's public key to decrypt that. She gets the digest out of this. She's going to compare the two digests. If it matches, it's going to tell her two things. What two things is it going to tell her? What's that? This verified that it hasn't been altered from the time it got sent, but what else does it tell her? It had to have come from Bob. Why? Because the only thing that will decrypt Bob's private key will be his public key. So she knows it had to have come from him. So we can use hashing in several different forms here to be able to get these messages across. Do you prefer the visual on this? Does this help you understand it a little better than just talking about it? Okay, so again, if you want this slideshow, just let me know. Ty, you got, did you get that? Who's Ty? Did you get that this morning or last night? Excellent. So, yeah, if you want this slideshow, happy to send that to you as well. Okay, well, Eric, if you could send it to me, I'll send that to all the guys here and the ones over here. Nice. We can do it that way. Yeah, I can do that. I don't know it's copyrighted. That might be a problem. No. So when we take a look at the hashing algorithms that are out there, we mentioned that MD5 is only 128 bits long. Your book calls it obsolete. So NIST and the NSA felt that there were too many collisions at 128 bits, so they came out with SHA-1, which was 160 bits. It's being phased out because, again, there are too many collisions. There is now SHA-2, which it can either be the 256 or the 512 uh, bits that are inside of this. A couple other hashing algorithms, RIPEMD, many of our passwords, NTLM is which Microsoft's using, Bcrypt and PBKDF2 are used on some of our computer systems to be able to store information as hashes. So these would be some of the things that we might be able to see. Why is this not? So when we take a look at this, this is comparing some of the hashes. There are tools out there like this that you can use and say, I want to go find this file. So at the very top of this, what you're looking at is so a tool called hash check. So I'm going to go look at this file that's there. I'm looking at this as a text string. 
and I'm asking it to give me the hashes for MD5, for SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-384, SHA-512, here's RIPE-MD, Panama Tiger. So it's showing me all of these different hashes that come from one file. So yeah, you can have a different hash for each and every one of these. Okay, we got a couple, well now, ah, it's just driving me crazy. From the current slide, come on. Give me one second here. My computer's acting funny. Okay, I know why. There we go. Okay, we got a couple questions, then we'll take a short break. First question, which type of cryptography is most commonly used for key exchange? Asymmetric, yes. Which type of cryptography is usually used for password storage? That's going to be our hashing. Order the following cryptographic ciphers from weakest to strongest. So which one of these is the weakest? Des. Des. Which one is next weakest? Or next strongest, I should say. Uh, Trip Des. Followed by? Lowfish. And the strongest? AES. So Des, Trip Des, Blowfish, and AES is the order in which it's used. Which of the following was originally designed as a stream cipher? It's the old RC4 because that was originally designed for wireless as this bit by bit stream cipher. All the others are block ciphers. What asymmetric algorithm uses complex new mathematical approach to create relatively short but very secure and high performance keys? ECC, elliptical curve cryptography, again, used for your phone system. According to NIST, what is the effective strength of a 168 bit tripped as key? 80 bit, yes. What process gives integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation? Diffie-Hellman Diffie is just there for key exchange. It is the digital signature, yep. So the hash alone gives integrity. The HMAC adds authenticity, but a digital signature adds the non-repudiation. So that gives us all three of those. You received an assortment of files along with the accompanying hash to guarantee integrity, but some of the hash values are 256-bit, some are 512. Assuming that they all use the same basic algorithm, what might it be? SHA-2, yes. 